our next segment will be our rapid fire segment uh, with two forward leaning pioneers pushing the boundaries of the supply chain with what else? AI. AI is increasingly transforming every touch point of logistics, as you've heard already this morning. And most these two companies have not only embraced AI, but they're leading the way. Please help me welcome my esteemed colleague, Sanish Kashav, Prologis' Chief Technology Officer, who will guide us through this next segment. Hello, everyone. Uh, we've had an incredible lineup so far. Um, show of hands, who's been keeping count of the number of times AI has been mentioned today? Well, I have some bad news. We're probably going to double that in the next 15 minutes or so. But on the plus side, we're going to be introducing two great companies that are doing some pioneering work with uh, AI. As AI continues to reshape our industry, the critical question is how can companies harness technology to solve today's supply chain challenges while paving the way for the future? Because this is a fast-moving train, like Hamid says, and the technology is evolving. We're thrilled today to highlight the work of two groundbreaking companies, both part of our Prologis Ventures portfolio of companies, who are at the forefront of this revolution and transformation. Their innovative solutions that you're going to hear about in a bit are tackling some of the toughest challenges that today are facing the supply chain, the modern supply chain. They're setting new standards for what's possible. So let's dig right in. First up, I'm pleased to introduce Nicole Matza, Chief Commercial Officer at Relay Technologies, who will share how her company is driving change in frontline operations with some cutting edge AI solutions. Welcome, Nikki. So before we chat, a little bit about Relay Technologies. So Relay Technologies is revolutionizing the way e-commerce deliveries are done. The biggest paradigm shift is going from the last mile to the last 100 meters. And we'll hear more about that from Nikki in a bit. At Prologis, we understand the critical role that efficient logistics plays in the success of any operation. All of our customers re rely on that. And Relay's innovative, tech-driven approach is a game changer. By leveraging a network of hyper-local partners that are AI-powered, uh, route optimization included, Relay is not only speeding up deliveries, but also significantly reducing costs and having a favorable environmental impact in doing so. So let's take a closer look at Relay Technologies, how it's reshaping the future of delivery. Run the video, please. There's so much complexity in how to move things, and you're essentially moving things around the world. If I put myself in the shoes of a consumer and I think about how far consumer expectations have evolved in e-commerce, we get our burger delivered in under 20 minutes, we get our grocery shop in 10 minutes, but retail has lagged behind so much. And I think that's what excites me, is all that missed opportunity within retail e-commerce to really push the boundaries and take it to the next level. We redesigned the delivery network to accelerate e-commerce and make it faster, cheaper, and greener. You can go on, let's say, Timu, and you see Timu's app, and you'll see Royal Mail every relay there as the delivery options. When you press delivery, if you live in one of the areas where we um, deliver packages, it will be a relay delivery driver giving it to you at your doorstep. We started off the past 10 years in logistics. And prior to launching Relay, we spent our time building out Stewart Delivery. And at Stewart, what we did was build out an on-demand same-day delivery capability. And we scaled that business from about zero to 400 million in revenue and profitable in under five years, which was an insane journey. 
And so that's what sparked that first uh, glimpse into us launching Relay. The way we did it is to move away from that traditional hub and spoke model that we know of, where we're actually sorting those parcels in one go, instead of doing a national sort and a regional sort in two different locations. So we drop off sacks of packages at local convenience stores. So it's five minutes to the shop, five minutes in the shop, we call it the pit stop for a reason. And the beauty of this model is that delivery drivers already exist. They're already working with the likes of Uber, Deliveroo, Uber Eats. The dwell time of those parcels is really short. We turn the last mile that we know of today into the last hundred meters. And that's the most powerful thing of the network. Because we've, we've built our whole model around a mathematical optimization and the psychology of driving incredible experiences, we have obsessed about how much data we capture from day one. And as we get more and more data, we become better and better and better at optimizing our network. By being close to the end customer, a courier can roll out of bed in the morning, look at what's available in the area, and start delivering within five minutes because that's their closest pit stop to them. And that makes the model so strong. We're leveraging marginal capacity, but we're doing it in a way that benefits the consumer, benefits the retailer, benefits the courier. First and foremost, we're going to expand nationwide to the UK because we want to become the go-to delivery company for e-commerce. And so every consumer in the UK wants their package delivered by a relay courier. And that's super exciting. Great video, Nikki. Welcome again. So let me ask you this about uh, there are delivery networks and then there are delivery networks. What differentiates relay te technologies? So if we start double clicking on how we turn that last smile into the last 100 meters, what really differentiates that is the ability to leverage an on-demand fleet of couriers that we just saw in the video. But not only do we use that on-demand fleet of couriers, we're combining that with real-time mobility technology that enables us to do things that incumbent providers cannot do. A real-life example of that would be how we're able to surge specific routes in real time that enables us to essentially 2x capacity on the last mile on a given day. And if we further deep dive into that and we think about the data points that we're collecting, we're talking about 1,600 data points per shipment. And what that enables to do effectively is really monitor and understand that courier behavior in detail to the point that we understand, are we pricing that route correctly? Should we be updating that pricing on the spot in order to ensure that the courier accepts that route and we ensure end customer promises met? Now, if you further deep dive into that, there's the element of what defines that pricing. How do we define what that pricing is that will ultimately lead to that acceptance? And in those root estimates, there's hundreds of factors that we need to take into account. Things like the weather impact, the time of day, the day of the week, are we delivering to apartment blocks or actually terraced houses? That makes a massive difference into how we need to really think about a route with its individual characteristics to mirror and bake that into courier pay. And so really the way we can think about it is that our algorithms are constantly scanning our network to see where do we need to intervene live to ultimately protect that end customer experience. That's what enables us to ultimately deliver 99% on time, day in and day out. That's fascinating. So while you're disrupting the traditional supply chain models, there are some common misconceptions that people may have about how things work. What are some of the ones that you've run into, that you've challenged, and you've overcome? Yeah, great. I think the biggest one that we're challenging at Relay is that faster delivery means expensive. And we're proving exactly that to be wrong. And that's thanks to the network design we've built where we're ultimately bringing parcels closer to the courier and the end customer, which means that we don't have to trade off speed, cost, and service quality anymore. And that means we can pass that on to our retailers and their end customers. And it's all about that pit stop being hyper-local 
that enables us to really have the cost of the last mile. And if we think that the last mile represents over 60% of the total cost of a delivery, then that's how we're moving the needle. That's where we make the biggest difference. Great. So you mentioned the amount of data that you collect and how you act on that, and you have AI algorithms running on it. What are some of the maybe surprises that you've run into as you've looked at your data? I think there are, so there's a few. I think the first one that we've observed are how couriers become, are able to become 40% faster between their first and their 10th through in that same area. So if we look at that, we are matching our algorithms to maximize their utilization in that preferred area so that we maximize their efficiency as quickly as possible and get them to being as fast as possible. So that's the first one. I think the second that was extremely surprising to us was, imagine two routes that are next to each other with the same number of parcels and the same distance, one of them being able to be two times longer than the other. And so that goes back to the initial point that we were making about really honing in into the individual root characteristics that you need to take into account in the root estimates. The exact streets you go down, the weather, the time of day of the route, the apartments versus housing blocks. And that's something that we see big variations on. So we've really heavily invested into making those root estimates as accurate as possible to ensure that couriers are being paid appropriately, depending on the characteristic of the route. And that's something that we really don't see happening uh, across the board with, our, uh, with the incumbent delivery providers. And that's maybe also why they're asking us to help them in London, for instance. Got it. Well, fascinating. Uh, thank you so much, Nikki, and uh, appreciate you being here. And thank you. Thanks for having us. OK, so now let's uh, shift our focus to another trailblazer in the AI space. Um, I would like to welcome Josip Cisic. By the way, the only last name that's harder to pronounce than mine here today. Um, Josip is the CEO of Gideon and is pioneering the integration of autonomous robotics into supply chains, tackling some of the toughest challenges in material handling and logistics. Josip, welcome. So, Josip, thank you for joining us, and uh, congrats, by the way, on uh, the recent investment from Toyota, and also your ongoing collaboration with NVIDIA, good stuff. So before we uh, dive into the questions I have for you, let's watch a video about your company. is the first most advanced autonomous forklift that applies AI capabilities and really solves huge unsolved problem, which is loading and unloading of truck trailers. So what's Loading Bay really? Like Loading Bay connects two worlds. It connects to companies, it connects to facilities. Typically, there is very little connection or very little insight between those two worlds. Tray really unlocks solution to this problem by applying that level of flexibility. Tray will come, it will check, it will inspect what's going on and decide which pallet will go out first. And it will repeat essentially the process through the entire trailer. Every trailer from the size perspective, from angle which it's parked at, those nuances are something that Tray handles without problems. It collects images and other sensory inputs and uses that to learn to, to extend capability. Historically, we had a person driving a forklift. And this person now, instead of driving one forklift, becomes forklift operator for fleet of vehicles. So it's not anymore one to one, it's one to five or one to 10 or one to 15, which means one person can really do much more work. It also ensures that the system, the entire process stays more safe and generates less damages. 
we really started collecting data. We had collection of our neural networks, collection of our AI models that we train for different elements of this process. We have perception capabilities, we have localization and mapping capabilities, we have action capabilities. Essentially, learning from data and more exposed we get to the world, better the system is. So autonomy is really showing us that path to the world where we have collaboration between robots and humans. We have Trey that comes to the world in, in a different form factor. It's a forklift, but it's also a smart device that is just as smart as a smartphone, but on top of that it can move goods, it can do some work instead of us. And that kind of collaborative shared world between humans and smart devices that can also move is something that the world of supply chain will benefit from in the coming years. With Gideon's technology, we're having those robots that are powered by AI and 3D visual perception capabilities that can really on the fly be flexible, just enough to address to solve what's needed. Trey continues collecting data with every engagement with new load carrier, with every manipulation it does, it gets better over time. And it's not only that it gets better, all trays together share that common knowledge. So the base gets stronger, the data sets get richer. It's really surprising and, and every time extremely exciting and engaging to hear from customers that they thought that this problem is not possible to be solved. I love that feedback. I love to hear that thing which tells us we are on the right track and that's really what world needs from us. Good stuff, Josip. Let me ask you a two-part question. So, um, same question I asked Nikki. There are autonomous mobile robots in the industry today, some of them in use. What are some of the unique challenges that Gideon is seeking to address with your AMRs? And second, when you think of uh, robots, you think of efficiency, and that's obviously a, a benefit to be had. What are some of the more unusual benefits that you were mentioning to me off stage that you've seen with uh, your, your technology? Yeah. So first of all, we as a company very much focus on trailer loading and unloading, uh, which was a very difficult problem to automate in the past. Um, and I'll give one example through the unloading process. So unloading process connects to worlds, connects to companies, to facilities that typically exchange very little data. And so when unloading process starts, it really deals with something that was started like thousands of miles away, right? From different people, different facilities. And what we really need here to automate this process is we need highly capable vehicles that will understand the world very similar to how we humans understand it. And so in each case, robot will step forward and then have to make decision like which pallet will go out first. Historically, automation was very rigid. And here with AI-enabled technologies, we can make those decisions on the fly. So depending on the circumstances, on stability of the loads, of poses of each pallet, robot will make decisions what will go out first. So that's really AI-enabled AI type of application. Um, and we as a company have built that strong core, uh, strong core technology that automates uh, vehicles based on proprietary data sets, proprietary AI models, neural networks that are trained on top of all that's collected over years, over time. And yeah, exciting thing is that recently, also Jensen Huang, CEO of NVIDIA, featured us at Computex, large show uh, of NVIDIA, where he said, yeah, this is the company that's really applying AI in an incredible fashion. So collaboration with them was exciting for us uh, as well. But then on the, on the other side, there is a misconception in the market that we see. So companies very often think that they're not ready for automation. Uh, while we, we say it's really not the case. So change doesn't come just, you know, after you get very well prepared for it. So the change in automation is one of that thing, uh, is something that, th that comes after a decision. And those are two parallel tracks, like change management and automation adoption are two things that go hand in hand. And our tech that, that we are bringing to market really is that type of automation that doesn't require big decisions that are like all or nothing decisions. So incremental automation is possible with this kind of AI enabled devices. And then the, the last part is, is really big question, like how this affects 
um, employee satisfaction, right? How does robot that's brought in changes that perspective of employees? So we are seeing that, you know, historically, uh, forklift drivers were really just doing the giant work. They were just, you know, moving forklift from one point to another, and suddenly those people really have the chance to grow, and instead of being forklift drivers, they become forklift operators, right? Operators of fleets of vehicles. So it's, it's really here on one side to, to make sure employees are like from satisfaction perspective in the right spot, but the other side of facilities are really facing incredible uh, uh, challenges with turnover rates, people just not showing up at work, huge absenteeism challenges. You know, next day, facilities are not sure if they're going to be able to deliver what's needed. So robots like this help to mitigate, to sustain with that throughput that's expected. Let me, let me pick up on that last point, and it's kind of interesting because uh, it's probably the elephant in the room because when you talk of AI, there are all these prognostications about taking over human jobs and creating social unrest and so on. Um, and you're mentioning that employee satisfaction actually goes up when you deploy your robots. So help, help me understand that. And how do you see the whole human-robot interaction proceeding or as this technology matures? Yeah, th there's always this question of the fear. Like, should, should, really, should we feel the fear of, of robots taking over jobs? Um, but the truth is, and, and we have uh, a customer in Yorkshire region and have some very uh, recent numbers from that area where the stat says that over the last five years of time, the average age of forklift driver grew for four years which is almost mathematically impossible, right? It just tells us that people don't want to drive forklifts. And then at the same time, there's the other data uh, from Prologis that says roughly one third of all forklift drivers do loading and unloading work, full-time or part-time, right? So, and then on top of that, supply chain still includes significant amount of variability. And so can the technology handle everything? The answer is no. So what's needed is really combination. That fleet manager, that person that operates robots, is still very important. So we see this as capability augmentation play and not a replacement play. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Josip. So you heard from Nikki and Josip um, some enlightening thoughts on faster and cheaper automation is possible. And you heard incremental automation is possible. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Fascinating. So as we move forward, it's important to remember that while technology is evolving at a lightning speed, it's not about replacing people. It's about augmenting human capabilities, as Josip rightfully pointed out. And it creates a, a more collaborative, efficient future. And so on that note, I'll leave you with a little food for thought. Um, AI and robots are amazing, but they still can't do everything. After all, I have not yet run into a mobile robot. I hope you're working on one, um, Gideon, um, that can actually conduct a panel like this. So I think at least my job is safe. So Tracy, back to you on that note. I think that's really great that we can't replace you, Sinesh. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Joseph, Nikki, and Sinesh, um, for your vision to accelerate e-commerce and supercharge warehouse operations.